many ways, Kevin Barry was an ordinary schoolboy born in 1902 in Dublin. But he became known as one of Ireland's most iconic national heroes, and he's one of Belvedere's most well known past pupils. His short life ended on November 1st, 1920. He was executed by hanging. This has been chronicled extensively in literature, in music, and in folklore. Kevin, like many boys his age, became impassioned for Ireland's future and increasingly involved in the struggle for Ireland's independence. At just 15 years old, he joined the Irish Volunteers and he took part in several military attacks against the Crown forces. Despite his young age, he became a, a section commander and his last mission led to his capture and torture at the hands of the British. His trial took place on the 20th of October in 1920. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death by hanging, where he was then buried. The only mourners present were prison officials and two Catholic chaplains. In October 2001, he was reinterred in Glasnevin Cemetery after being afforded a full state honours funeral. What you will see in this exhibition is that of a normal schoolboy, but also one who dared to act on the courage of his convictions. We hope you will be surprised and touched by the effect his actions had on those who witnessed his courage firsthand and then who celebrated his bravery. How Kevin became one of Ireland's most well-known heroes. Knowing our past helps us understand the present. We cannot forget that Kevin was a Belvedere. He attended college from 1916 to 1919, and he is sure. much as part of the fabric and community of this college as the students present today. Kevin Barry was born on the 20th of January, 1902, to Thomas and Mary Barry at 8 Fleet Street, Dublin, and was baptised in St Andrew's Church in Westland Row. This family tree shows the Barry and Dowling sides of Kevin's family. In 1908, Tom Barry passed away at the age of 56. Mary moved the family to Tomby, County Carlow, where Tom Barry's family ran a dairy farm. Eventually, Kevin returned to Dublin. He enrolled in St Mary's College in Rathmines and from there he transferred to Belvedere College in 1916. Belvedere owes its origins to Father John Austin SJ who opened primary and secondary schools off Fishermill Street in 1750. The Society of Jesus have been active in the area around Hardwick Street since 1790 where they founded St. Francis Xavier's College in 1832. In the disused Poor Clare Convent on Harwick Street itself, with just nine students. In 1841, the Jesuits purchased Belvedere House on Great Denmark Street, where we are today, and which gave the school its name. The school has gone from strength to strength over the years and has gone from its original nine pupils to over a thousand today. At the heart of the city, Belvedere has borne witness to many of the major events of our time. It was caught up in the events of the 1916 Rising, when the British military opened fire at the Jesuit residence. Jesuits at Belvedere and the neighbouring Gardner Street community helped the wounded of 1916 and distributed food across the locality. The college also saw the bombing of the North Strand by the Luftwaffe, the bombing of Nelson's Pillar, and more recently, has witnessed the almost unprecedented social changes that our new 21st century has brought. But through it all, Belvedere has been there, providing stability and humanity for 188 years. Here we are, we're in the Finlay Building in Belvedere College. It's a bridge between two worlds. This is the original classroom where Kevin took his lessons, and it's also the classroom where many Belvedereans take their lessons today. The past is always present. In the very foundation and walls, it's in the DNA of the place. In this room, we have Kevin Barry's original desk, along with some of his textbooks, and a notebook that he used at his time here during his studies. 
The intellectual rigour and cultural values of the college are carried through since 1832. And while a hundred years have passed, and now the Ireland that Kevin lived in is radically changed, there's no doubt that he would recognise the core values which underpinned the college in his day, they are still evident today. Though each student is called to follow their own path, they are all called to be men for others. The archive is fortunate enough to hold these personal items of Kevin's, including a hairbrush, wallet, gloves, and a dance card. During his three years at Belvedere, Kevin studied Latin, French, Irish, and history. He also studied mathematics, or arithmetic as it was known then. You will notice he actually achieved 100% in arithmetic. Examples of his good attendance can be seen here. This report shows that he placed fourth in his class in his Christmas exams in his final year in the school. Like any schoolboy, he wrote and doodled and pasted pictures in his notebooks. You can also see the early interest of the military in his imagination. These lyrics to wrap the green flag show his interest in nationalist causes while he was at school. The Belvedereian from his final year in the college, includes a write-up of his experience on the rugby team, as well as several iconic photos of Kevin as a young lad, including one of him where he seems to be dressed as an altar boy. Kevin was also interested in broader political issues of his time. He cut out political cartoons related to the issues of the day and pasted them into this booklet. In 1917, during his first year at Belvedere, Kevin was first substitute on the Junior Cup rugby team that won the Leinster School's final in a win over Black Rock College. He was later a member of the senior team and was also secretary of the newly formed hurling club. Eugene Davy, who went on to win 34 international rugby caps for Ireland, played with Kevin on Belvedere's first hurling team. They are both in this photo of the 1917 team. Kevin in middle row and Eugene in bottom row. These letters from Kevin to his mother, his sister and friend show a normal schoolboy communicating about the everyday events of his life and inquiring after his family and friends. Dear Ma, the longer I am in this place the more I like it and its people. We have nothing to do all day and all day to do it. I hope none of the family were heard at the recruiting meetings. There was nothing here yet. Mr. McHugh was in Dublin for the park races, and did very badly, so he says. Dear Bapti, you know you might write to a fellow once in a while. When will you be up in town? You ought to come for a Cayley in the College of Science on the 30th of January. Hoping to see or hear from you soon. Yours till hell freezes, Kevin. P.S. Remember me to Mrs. Lane Dooley and Coyle. My dear Sheil, I am horribly sorry that I did not write sooner to thank you and Mick for the very handsome and acceptable present. I've got two lovely pairs of socks with clocks and a pair of garters. I'm very tired now as I played today. Result, Belvedere 47 points, I enjoy nil. There is a reign of terror in Dublin at present. Everyone is afraid to go out after dark. A soldier with a steel arm is robbing all before him. Kevin joined the IRA in October 1917, age 15, and was quickly promoted to section commander. The morning of the 20th of September, before retaking his medical exams, Kevin joined a group of IRA volunteers on Bolton Street in Dublin. The group was assigned to the task of ambushing a British army lorry as it picked up bread from a bakery on King Street. The lorry arrived at Patrick Monk's bakery a half hour late. Kevin's company surrounded the vehicle. 
A single shot was fired. Kevin's gun jammed twice and he hid under the vehicle for cover. Meanwhile, Barry's company fled the scene. Three soldiers died in the raid. Private Hal Washington, age 15, died at the scene, and Privates Marshall Whitehead, age 20, and Thomas Humphreys, age 19, later died of their wounds. Fog of Kevin in the year. Chunik ban in touch Kevin, fui kelt fui lori, agus eig fek in le Gawa Kevin agus tarangi a chamak e. Toga chwig a mark arm e agus kaisik a fiskul e. Eg arm na bratna agus ide kortu anam naka na nini el ag lock port sa unsi a skeha. Nirgeil Kevin an tolu shud doiv. Agus in the year shin astriach e chwig prison win show. Husagon Trail are in Fehu de Yerfor. Bay Kevin on K Dinner, a Kura Fween Trail, the Round Lee Milita, and on Ocht Ochoru de Lee and Aaron, Najeg Feha. August Rinna, Shana Huig, on the Dirt Ernst Honsecourt. Kushirch A, a Shri Kushiv, August Dunvaru, Sajor, Shingle Whitehead. Near of Kevin Sauce, Glocker, Le Glistenuk na Kurta, Makiela Shin, near Liga Dog Leodor, part a Glockus to Himakti. Kuntiak August Derry Kumbas A. La Sauna, Kroka, Kevin Barry. Following Kevin's conviction, there were at least five unsuccessful rescue attempts to free him from Mount Joy. Attempts were also made in London, Washington, and the Vatican to secure his release as coverage was making much of his young age along with that of the British soldiers who died. The Archbishop of Dublin urged that Kevin be released. These letters from MP Joseph Devlin to Kevin's national school teacher, Ned O'Toole, show the effort that Devlin made in his attempts to secure Kevin's release. I hope you will realise that I did all I could. In fact, I spent the whole day of Saturday and Sunday seeing everybody whom I thought could bring influence to bear. The night before Kevin's execution, Father Francis Brown, SJ, a well-known photographer, visited the Vice Regal Lodge in Phoenix Park to speak to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in yet another attempt to secure Kevin's release, but to no avail. Given the fact that Kevin was just 18 years of age, few believed that the British would go through with his execution. However, on the 28th of October, both Kevin and the general public learned that he was set to be executed on the 1st of November. On learning this, he is reported as saying, It is nothing to give one's life for Ireland. I'm not the first and maybe I won't be the last. What's my life compared with the cause? Kevin hoped for a firing squad rather than death by hanging, as he had been tried in a military court. He joked with his sister Cathy that, well, they are not going to let me like a soldier fall, but I must say they are going to hang me like a gentleman. On the 31st of October, Kevin was allowed a last visit from his mother, brother and sisters. And on the morning of his execution, Kevin heard two masses in his cell. Father Albert Bibby, a Capuchin chaplain, gave him his final communion and later described Kevin as a magnificent boy, wonderfully calm. As he left Kevin's cell, he asked him for any final words. Kevin replied, The only message I have for anyone is hold on and stick to the Republic. Kevin was hanged the morning of the 1st of November, 1920. Hundreds of people stood outside the prison gates, praying and protesting his execution. Kevin's death kicked off an escalation in the fighting between Britain and Ireland. And the following four weeks were the most violent in the conflict. Nine others were hanged in Mountjoy Prison and buried next to Kevin before the Irish War of Independence ended 
in July 1921. Known as the Forgotten Ten, a campaign was launched advocating for their bodies to be reburied with proper rights. In October 2001, they were given full state honours with a private ceremony at Mountjoy Prison. Following his execution, Kevin became a Republican martyr. Plays, poems, and songs written after his death helped tell Kevin's story. The most famous of these is the song Kevin Barry, which spread his story around the world. He was also commemorated in photos, postcards, remembrance cards, and stamps. Mrs. Barry received condolence letters from well-known figures, including these letters from Sean T. O. Kelly and Tom Casement. Newspaper clippings show the long reach of Kevin's death. And his story was also covered in a range of publications, from Republican-leaning and more mainstream newspapers, to several books written about Kevin including this one by Donald O'Donovan. Kevin's body was buried at 1.30pm in the yard of Mountjoy Prison. Canon John Waters, who'd accompanied Kevin to the scaffold, later wrote to Mary Barry and described his courage at the end of his life as... Superhuman. It rested, I'm sure, on his simple goodness and innocence of conscience. You are the mother, my dear Mrs. Barry, of one of the bravest and best boys I have ever known. His death was one of the most holy, and your dear boy is waiting for you now, beyond the reach of sorrow or trial. Schools have institutional memories. Some are very happy memories, and others are very sad. We mourn the tragic death of all our students. Our sense of loss is especially keen when their death is the consequence of injustice and a failure to achieve peace and reconciliation. Belvedere of the 1920s was a very different school in a very different country. However, we continue to teach the same values and to nurture a commitment to justice in all our students. 100 years after the execution of Kevin, one of Ireland's most celebrated figures, we remember the past so that we do not forget the sacrifices made by so many in gaining Irish independence. In remembering the past, we hope to understand the present and to learn lessons from our history in charting our future. In memory of Kevin Barry, Old Belvedere, 1919.